Mayor Lightfoot, welcome to the Field Museum. It's my pleasure. We're delighted to have you here. I'm looking forward to this. You are here in Stanley Field Hall, the, the former home of Sioux, now the home of Maximo, the largest animal that's ever been discovered to have walked on Earth. It weighs roughly the same as a 737. Wow. It's an amazing specimen. It's beautiful. We've got 150, 170 scientists at work here when we're open. 40 million specimens and objects. It's one of the greatest records of the history of life on Earth right here in Chicago. The pleasure of being able to really just take in not only the beauty of the exhibits, but also the beauty and majesty of the building is quite a treat. Good. And I'm marveling at these overhead. I think they look like kind of colonies and sculptures. These are pretty rudimentary plants that are through many, many, many stages of evolution directly related to the kind of thing that this animal must have eaten in large quantities in a day. So can you tell us a little bit about the history um, of the Field Museum? When did it start? Um, how did it come into existence? And why was it started um, here in Chicago? It grew directly out of the 1893 World's Fair. Mm -hmm. The Columbian Exposition, at the end of it, some of the leading lights of the city of Chicago went to Marshall Field and said, will you pay for the preservation of many of the elements of that exposition yeah, right. in a museum for the children of the Midwest. And Marshall Field responded with a very generous gift that made it possible. It was originally housed in what is now known as the Museum of Science and Industry. That was the, the only permanent building of the 1893 right. World's Fair. In 1921, it was moved to this building, which was again paid for by a bequest from Marshall Field, the first. Well, obviously this museum um, is incredibly important in the cultural life um, of our city, and I know that you do a lot to educate children in Chicago and the surrounding area. Well, Mayor, we would love to show you one of our exhibits. We're delighted to have the opportunity to show it to you now. Well, I'm excited. Great. So let's Let, go do it. Let's go have a look at it. Okay, great. Mayor Lightfoot, welcome to the Dinosaur Hall. It's my pleasure. I mean, it's just uh, fascinating. One of our largest real fossils is this. This is the animal that used to be called Brontosaurus, huh. but Field Museum's first curator of paleontology synonymized Brontosaurus under the name Apatosaurus. So since 1903, the proper name for this guy is Apatosaurus, but it's a big sauropod. These so, are the biggest of the dinosaurs. So what did it eat? Did so it this eat? is a plant eater. And depending on whether it was warm-blooded or cold-blooded, it was a real challenge to get enough food through that relatively tiny head. This is one of the main plant-eating groups from the Jurassic of North America. Okay. So it must have literally been eating nonstop yes, every day. Yes, that's, that's uh, clearly the idea. Wish and, we could see one now to prove that. <laughs> <laughs> and how big do they get? Is this kind of typical of what we theorize as a size? Yeah, of this is a pretty good size. From some of the bones, though, for example, you can see the shoulder blade, which is two bones. It's still in yeah. two bones, so they haven't fused together, which would, is what happens in the older adults. But this animal is about 75 feet long, would have weighed something like 40 tons in wow. life. They were big animals. I'm noticing here um, there's a display on, on plants. And yeah. I'm a gardener, so tell me a little bit about why uh, the plants are here among all these dinosaurs. Well, you know, we try and put the animals in their um, environment, which includes plants, of yeah. course. Back in the Mesozoic, cycads would have been very common. Plants like ginkgos would have been very common. They, those were the lower things. And then the towering conifers. There yeah. were no, not early in the Mesozoic, no flowering plants yeah. yet. That comes along in the Cretaceous. So I've always loved ginkgo trees, and I finally got Aren't they one. Beautiful. Planted in my front yard. So yeah. I'm waiting for it to come back yet this spring. There are ginkgos between the museum and Soldier Field, and it's always fun to see that distinctive leaf, isn't yes. it? Yes. Yes, very much so. So should we move on? Yeah, let's take a little stroll down here. Mayor, this is a Tyrannosaur. It's not T-Rex. It's an earlier, ah. smaller animal called Despletosaurus. It's from Alberta, Canada, and was collected in the 1920s. And it is looming over its victim, which is a duckbill dinosaur. And this duckbill, which is called Lambiosaurus, is, along with Sue, one of our most complete dinosaurs. Almost everything you see here is not only real, but it was found in this position. Uh. 
which is really unusual. So scavengers didn't get to it, it was buried very quickly. So this, this so is, a, I think, a really great dynamic display, predator prey. So this is essentially a smaller version of the T-Rex. You see the large head with the big teeth. Absolutely. And then you see, but you see the shorter um, arms. Absolutely, the little two-fingered arms that we still haven't figured out a purpose for. Yeah, it's like you know any family. For example, the cat family. We've got little house cats and Siberian tigers. Yeah. So. All right. So tell me about this guy. Yeah, so this is one of the end members of the horn dinosaur family. We've got one of the earliest ones here, Protoceratops. That's from the Gobi Desert of Mongolia. But at the very end, this is what Sue had to fight off and prey upon. Triceratops is one of the last dinosaurs, along with T. rex, to be alive until the asteroid hits and we've got that big extinction at 66 million years ago. Did meat-eating um, dinosaurs exist at the same time as plant-eating dinosaurs? Yes, often in an evolutionary lineage you'll see meat-eaters first and then the plant-eaters will evolve soon after. But I yes, see. through most of the history of dinosaurs there have been both types. Wow, interesting. And this was one of the largest plant-eating dinosaurs that T-Rex had to deal with. Oh. Uh, the other big one was a big duck-billed dinosaur called Edmontosaurus, and we'll see skulls of both of those in the Sioux Hall. Okay. Shall we? Yes, absolutely. Mayor Lightfoot, we're now in the Sioux Hall. When we first put Sioux together and unveiled it in 2000, it was in the big main right. hall. But we couldn't really put it in context there. It was, it was just another pretty face. We wanted to build an exhibit hall around it, and that's what this is all about. Mm -hmm. So we took the whole skeleton apart. It's made to be taken apart so it can be studied, mm -hmm. and moved it up here. We made some improvements because we know, know more about T-Rex than we did before. Probably the biggest change in the mount is these structures in the belly that look sort of like ribs. They're sometimes yes. referred to as belly ribs. The technical term is gastralia. We always had those, but we weren't exactly sure how they went together on this animal. So we were able to put the gastralia on it. And now Sue has this big belly. It looks a lot more massive than it did in Stanley Field Hall. So you obviously learned a lot about the T-Rex over time. Absolutely, over those 20 years, we know a lot more about this animal than we did when we mounted it the first time. So can you give us a few of the, uh, the insights that um, paleontologists have learned since Sue was discovered and then was uh, first put on display 20 years ago? So it gave us the opportunity to sample a few bones that we hadn't been able to before. Mm -hmm. Dinosaurs, like trees, stop growing for a season during every year. Oh. And so, like trees, they leave rings. We oh. call them lines of arrested growth, not tree rings, obviously. Mm -hmm. You just count those rings, and you get an idea of how old the oh. animal was. We now think Sue is closer to 33 years old when it died rather than 28. So that's some of the new science that's come about since we took Sue down and moved it up here. It's fascinating. So this is not the actual head that was found. Is no, that the actual head never mm -hmm. gets on the end of the neck because it's the most studied part of the skeleton and it's just too hard to study 13 feet up in the air. So that's a plastic cast. You saw that the skull was a bit distorted. Any bone that big when it gets buried and then the sediment compacted mm -hmm. into rock gets distorted. So what we did was we took the, basically molded the skull and then made casts and took the casts apart, cut it apart and put it back together, removing as much of the distortion as we could. And so we think that's what Sue's skull would have looked like when it was not crushed as it is now. So one of the things that I think uh, people forget is that the Field Museum is a working laboratory. Scientists and paleontologists come here to study the various specimen and exhibits. Is that right? There is a cutting edge research institution behind the scenes here. And in fact, my collection, the vertebrate paleontology collection, is pretty representative of all the collections throughout the building. Less than one half of one percent of my collection is on display. There is a huge collection and research being done all the time on that collection. We're going out into the field multiple times every year to learn new things, discover new animals in this case. We are a big research institution as well as an exhibit museum. And that's true of the original Sioux head. It's built in a display that can pull out 
so that scientists can actually get a closer look at the actual Absolutely. head itself. Absolutely, yeah. Our exhibits folks are so good. They understand that these fossils, while they're on display, are still part of the research collection, and they need, researchers need access. Do we know anything about the other dinosaurs that were like this? What can you tell us about how they were arranged? Were they families, tribes? What's, what's yeah, the word so, for it? So like any organism, they're arranged in a hierarchical taxonomy classification. T-Rex, Tyrannosaurus rex, belongs to the family that's named for it, the Tyrannosauridae. And there are many other Tyrannosaurs besides T-Rex. Mm -hmm. T-Rex just happens to be the last one and the biggest one. They're a family that started in Asia and then migrated to North America mm -hmm. and attained gigantic size. This is from an, a group of dinosaurs called Silurosaurs, which means hollow bone. Oh. And most of them are about this big or even smaller. Every bird that's ever lived is a Silurosaur, but there was one group that got gigantic, and that's the Tyrannosaurs. You said that they started in Asia and then they came to North America. The world looked different then than it does now, obviously. It did, although by the time T. rex was alive, you'd recognize it. It wasn't so different, but the farther back in time you go, yes, the continents move, and at one point they were all in one landmass called Pangaea. But the end of the Cretaceous, 66 million years ago, you'd recognize that world. All right. And you mentioned birds. Now, yes. we think about the, the theory that the asteroid came and hit and killed the dinosaurs in one way or another. But they weren't all extinct no. as a result of that. No, what, we always survived? talk about the dinosaurs going extinct. But in fact, every bird that's ever lived is a theropod dinosaur, just like Sue. Not all of them went extinct at the end of the Cretaceous. The non-flying dinosaurs, yes, they went extinct. But the birds made it through and had a big adaptive radiation. And there are over 10,000 dinosaurs alive today. Every time we sit down at our Thanksgiving dinner, we're having a <laughs> theropod dinosaur. So the birds that we see today that are flying in the air, chickens, turkeys, those Every are all of descendants of dinosaurs in the same family line. Every one of them are Silurosaur dinosaurs, just like the Tyrannosaurs wow. are Silurosaur dinosaurs, yes. Fascinating. And you know, we think of the age of mammals after the dinosaurs died out, then mammals had their big shot. Well, there are, I don't know, some 6,000 species of mammals alive, so there are still more dinosaurs alive now than mammals. So I gotta ask you, Jurassic Park, fan or not a fan? Oh, I love the Jurassic Park movies. I mean, they're entertainment too, so they're not 100% accurate. They were <laughs> never meant to be. But one aspect of the Sioux Project relates to, I think, people's impression from the first Jurassic Park movie. There's a scene in that movie where they're out in the field and they've got these little paintbrushes and they're just brushing off the gravel like it's that easy and there's this complete skeleton. Yeah. <laughs> so when we prepared Sue, I was in charge of the preparation of Sue, which is a term we use for taking the rock off of the bones mm. so that they can be seen and studied, and in this case actually put on an exhibit. We did all of that preparation in two labs which were glass fronted. One was down in Disney World, down in Orlando, and the other was, is still here, the McDonald's lab here on the second floor, so that people could see that no, it's not just brushing gravel off a skeleton. Much more complicated We than took 30,000 hours just to get wow. the rock off the bones. Wow, 30,000 hours? Yeah. That's a lot of time. It's a lot of time. It's a lot of surface area. There was a lot of rock to move. Well, and obviously you want to take that care yes. so you to preserve the bone. Absolutely. You, don't, you only get one shot at it, and no amount of research is going to fix damage that yeah. you've done to a bone. This has been incredibly fascinating, and we barely scratched the surface, but I appreciate your time today, and I think anybody who's coming uh, to see any part of the museum, don't skip the dinosaur exhibit. It's fascinating. Mayor Lightfoot, thank you so much. It's been a great honor. Thank you for sharing really your life's work with us. Thank you. This exhibition is called Absalage Women and Warriors. The exhibition is built off of our historical collection, which is one of the most significant collection of Apsalage material. So Apsalage is the name of the tribe in Montana who are also known as the Crow. And Crow came because when the French heard the word Apsalage, which means people with the long beak, mm. they translated that into 
the word in French, which is crow, uh, and then the English translated it into crow. I see. But their own name for themselves is Apsalage. So yeah. we use that here. So we're reclaiming their name, not the translated by the French and the, uh, the English. Exactly, exactly. Two beautiful photographs. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about this wall. Sure. These are photographs taken by Adam Sings in the Timber, who lived here in Chicago for many years. He was raised on the Apsalage Reservation. He's an amazing photographer. What we wanted to capture in this exhibit is both the sort of continuity across generations and the important role that women play in Apsalage society. Mm -hmm. And so you're seeing women of all ages here. Mm -hmm. You're seeing wisdom keepers, culture bearers, people who have doctorates are contributing back to their people. So the idea is like in this very vibrant way to bring the story of the past together with the present. Now this exhibit was curated by a woman who herself is of Salake, yes? Right. Her name mm -hmm. is Nina Sanders. It's a first major exhibition at the Field Museum curated by a Native American woman. This was her vision that she put together with the help of many scholars and Crow community leaders, Apsalage community leaders. She invited over 20 contemporary Apsalage artists to also contribute their work to the exhibit. So behind you is a piece by Ben Pease, who's a very well-known Apsalage artist. Apsalage people have a different view of gender, you know, that it's not about this is the man, this is the woman. There's a lot more fluidity mm -hmm. to the way they think about mm -hmm. gender. You can see this in the, in the photographs. These exactly. are women are clearly all very strong and powerful, and there's a confidence that I see in each of the photographs, regardless of the age. Yeah. Now, my understanding is that um, there's about 65,000 um, Native Americans that live just in Chicago, in the second largest kind of urban population in the country. Is that, that right? That's right, in the whole Chicago Area. land region. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Native peoples were here, were always here. Well, I hope that we'll be telling those stories as a regular part of the curriculum within CPS, but also in other schools across the city. Knowing our history and every, every facet of it is critically important. One of the things that is really resonating with me is the power of community. Mm -hmm. How each member of community is important, is uplifted, and plays a really special role, not only in the present, but in carrying forward the traditions um, of that um, Native community and how we can take, uh, I think, really heart from that today. You, you said it yourself. We're socially distancing, um, but we can't lose our sense of community and who we are as a people. That's what I keep thinking as I'm walking through uh, this exhibition. You said it beautifully. Couldn't say it any better than oh, that. Thank you. That's really thank you. wonderful. Welcome to Field Museum's Insect Collection. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm Petra Sievold. I'm a curator here. How'd you get interested in insects? Because there are so many species. It's right. unbelievable. Oh. 400,000 described beetle species. Oh. Yeah, that is an enormous. And they live in every ecosystem on this planet. Our collection is global in scope, oh. but with major focus on the Americas. Okay. Most of our insect collections are pinned. Uh -huh. We have specimens from the end of 18th century, and a large number of our specimens are also preserved in ethanol, like this tarantula, for example. So this is just a tarantula in ethanol. Wow, that is an enormous <laughs> creature. Yeah. yeah. Let's move over to the collection and see Robin. Hi, Hello, Robin. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you, too. Uh, I'm a collection digitization specialist here at the museum. So that's very fancy words. Tell me what that means. Yes. So it is my job to attach QR codes. They're, they're unique, so it represents a catalog number, on every single specimen. And then I transcribe 
all the collecting data from okay. every single label that's attached to a specimen and I enter that into a database. Then that information is made available worldwide to researchers all over the So I see the pens, right. but what happened to the specimens themselves? You might not be able to see that, but this whole drawer contains what are called burrowing water beetles. Oh, so these little, little tiny, those are the that's specimens. That's the specimen, wow. yes, 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 yes. Wow. So we've got some larger specimens. Here we have I'd a say drawer. Quite a bit larger. Yes. So these <laughs> are um, earth burrowing dung beetles. Wow. So they're related to scarabs. Okay. You can tell they look like yep. you know the big guys that roll up the balls. Here we have what are called stag beetles, and they're aptly named because their mandibles appear or resemble deer antlers. Ah. And those are the males. We actually have a drawer of some much larger stags. Ooh. They have quite impressive. Yeah, those look like they can do some damage. They do. I mean, they, they use that to fight over females and mating territory, etc. But they don't use those to eat or... No, no. They actually have physical mandibles that they use for, you know, chewing and eating food. Okay. And the reason why this kind of information is so important right now to make that available is that all this information represents a snapshot in time of that specimen that can never be replicated. Mm -hmm. So w once that information is made available anywhere in the world, um, researchers can track historic uh, populations. Mm -hmm. They can uh, check for distribution changes. With the um, decline in insects right now, insect populations, yes. that, that information is this extremely is important. important history. Oh, in very important history. So what's the kind of detail um, that you are then digitizing uh, that someone who is a researcher could find out about each of these little specimens? So uh, typically on the collecting labels, there's the the who, the where, the how, and the when. So you get, it might say, well, in this case it says, uh, Florida, Alachua County, Paynes Prairie, near Gainesville. And it was collected in August 21st, 1961. And it was collected by F.N., which is Frank N. Young. He was a aquatic beetle specialist. Okay. So I'm going to tell you, you have clearly fantastic eyesight. Because <laughs> that just looks like a blur. Oh, of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, without no, my it's... glasses, it just looks like a blur of letters. I do end up using the microscope at least once or twice a day. I mm -hmm. have to examine the labels very closely. And, and it's, it's a wonderful thing when they're pre-printed like this. But I get a lot of handwritten labels. They're cryptic. They mm -hmm. might be from Europe. I can't read them. It's yeah. It's a tough. It's a tough job. <laughs> so just to, to step back and you think about, you know, I mean, young uh, students who may be watching this. Uh, what's the most important thing that you hope that they learn about the work that you do every day? What I think is so relevant about the work that I do mm -hmm. is that these collections have sat on shelves for decades, mm -hmm. collecting dust. And there has been a huge movement, probably in the last decade or less, where all the cultural institutions worldwide have realized the relevance of this information and that we can share it and we can make it accessible. And is that because these insect populations are, are disappearing yes, all across absolutely. the world? Yes, absolutely. Yes, yes. Insects in general play a huge role in the success of our existence. I mean, we, people don't realize how important they, they are. So there may be some people who are watching this and think, ugh. I don't like insects. Ick factor, huh? But, yeah. but, but they're important. They are, I can't even begin to explain how important they are. They, we wouldn't have beautiful flowers. We wouldn't, we wouldn't have flowers. Insects. We wouldn't have, what, two-thirds of our crops. We, they're, they're pollinated by you know, bees and, and other types of uh, pollinators. Um, they make our silk. They are excellent um, recyclers. They put nutrients back into the soil. They, they uh, are scavengers. Mm -hmm. if, if it wasn't for, let's say, the dung beetle or beetles that eat carrion, rotting, you know, carcasses, mm -hmm. we would be standing, I've read this, knee deep in, yeah. you know what? Unmentionables. Um, unmentionables. There you go. <laughs> Insects make the world go round. They do. They absolutely do. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you very much well for sharing said. your time mm -hmm. with us. Yep. Thank you. Appreciate it. Great meeting you. Great to meet you. We have here put together interesting and larger specimens from a diversity of insects. So basically to show there is more to insects than beetles. And starting out at that corner here are actually my research animals, arachnids and myriapods. So kids, we're talking about spiders mm -hmm. and millipedes and centipedes. centipedes. These are really fascinating. And quite big. <laughs> yes, they are big, that is true. Well, there are relatively big centipedes, for example, Scolopendra in Florida. I mean, they can be like this and mm -hmm. s 
centipedes are the ones that bite and millipedes are the ones that basically munch down the leaf litter in a deciduous forest. So they are kind of in waste management um, and very good <laughs> at it. And they have done that for the last 450 million years. So. <laughs> So tell us a little bit about the title. So we have the name mm -hmm. of the beetle. It's Titanus, uh, I'm going to say Gigantus. Yeah. Then there's the class, the order, the suborder, the family, the subfamily, genus, species. What are all these different categories? Oh, you are asking for the classification. Yes. So these organisms are organized in a classification according to similarity, shared characters. And so all beetles share particular characters in their body plan, for example, they all have hard wing covers. Several species, species similar to each other, are grouped into a genus. Then several simil similar genera are placed into a family. So this is basically a ranking system according to similarities. Like all mammals share particular characters. We all have hair. Mm -hmm. uh, all mammals have hair. All mammals produce milk to produce their young. So mm -hmm. that is one of the groupings. This classification tells the specialist a lot about the characters found in these organisms. Mm -hmm. yeah. So all of the, whether it's an insect or a mammal, there's a set of classifications that are used to describe them and then kind of categorize them within their subgroups. Right, and that okay. was basically put, invented in 1758. Wow. Carl Linnaeus uh, in Sweden wrote the catalog, the first catalog kind of, of life, and that's where he orga how he organized the organisms at that time. Wow. And so, so almost 300 years yes. of organization of insects and mammals using the same class classification system all over the world. Yeah, it has been modified over time, but it goes back to that basic principle. Yes, exactly. And it is used, uh, that's a good point, by scientists all around the world. And that's why these Latin names, uh, or Latin or Greek derived scientific names are so important. Uh, because for example, what is called a house spider here is a different species than what a house spider in Europe would be. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but if we use the Latin names, their correct names, um, then we can always, we always know which group or which animal or organism we're talking about. So fun fact, Petra, yeah. which Chicago mayor took four years of Latin? You? That would be me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm a Latin nerd. <laughs> I had Latin in school. I had to take it, and otherwise I wouldn't have been able to study a biology. So, <laughs> let's talk about the, uh, yeah, the what I call the walking sticks. sticks. Yes, These and are they are walking beautiful. sticks. Yes, walking sticks, really beautifully camouflaged to look like basically twigs, part of trees, mm -hmm. and it's not only their body features, also their behavior is adapted. So they will not for example, make sudden movements, but swing kind of the same mm -hmm. way as a twig. Yeah. And the spines and tubercles basically disrupt the body image. So if it sits on a lichen-covered tree trunk, you, you couldn't will hardly, tell. You can't. Yeah, wow. it's really hard to tell. Others then have shock colors like uh, like these katydids with red wings. So suddenly opening them uh, when they fly away, and it has basically a shock effect on a would-be predator. Uh. Uh, that's how some of the butterflies and moths also operate with these colorations of thought or these patterns here on these moths. These are moths and butterflies from Illinois are thought to basically look like eyes mm -hmm. and when they open them a would-be predator like a bird is suddenly startled and will not necessarily pick at it. Well you can see on some of these moths there's four Looks eyes two sets. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I find all of them fascinating. I like the different colors. I like the different ways in which they adapt um, their bodies to their environment to yeah. ward off predators. So to me, it's all very interesting. The beetles I could probably do a little bit without, but <laughs> sorry, Petra. <laughs> Tell me, how long have you worked here at Since the museum? Since 1996. Wow, long time. Yeah, yeah a long, long time. time. Thank you for sharing your life's work with Thank us. Thank you very much for oh, coming. It's a pleasure. It's nice meeting you. Nice to meet you as well. I very much enjoyed my uh, time with you here today. We saw women warriors, we saw dinosaurs, and, and one of my favorite areas is insects. And I know we just started to scratch the surface, but hopefully that spurs a lot of curiosity and the people that were watching, I know it has with me, uh, to come back and learn more uh, at the Field Museum. Well, it's been a great pleasure to be able to show you some very small portion of the treasures of this great museum. And we do hope that you come back as well. 
I definitely will. Great. Thanks for being here. My pleasure.